Harris Creek, how we doing? Come on, it's so great to be back with you and uh, in God's word with you specifically. And so I'm gonna start with just this question. Have you ever had to like set out chairs? You ever had to like put out chairs for anything? You know what I'm talking about? Like when there's an event or whatnot. So I've been doing camps and those kinds of things for the past 10 years. And so I've gone to a lot of places and had to set out chairs. That's always a, a part of the, the speaker's roles. You set out chairs. And so I'm like a professional chair putter outer. And uh, like when we had uh, Imagine Banquet in here, if you were here for that, we had to clear this room and then set out the chairs. You know, it's different. Like different people can carry different number of chairs. Have you ever noticed this? Okay, like, so like Drew, the worship leader, yeah, that dude's sleeper strong, like crazy. Like he does CrossFit, and so he gets like 16 chairs. I don't know how he does it. Like he, man, is he set them out. Uh, Nate Hilgenkamp, he's more of a chair under each arm kind of guy, okay? That's where he, I said that in the first service, and so he challenged me to a who could carry more chairs back there, and he actually beat me, and so uh, he, he's strong too. But uh, what, what happens in that event, like at some point as we're setting out chairs, there's always, it always happens, there's always this like loud commotion and you turn around and somebody's dropped the chairs. It, it never fails. And the only reason someone drops the chairs is because they carried more than they should have. And the only reason they carried more than they should have is because they thought they could, okay? And what happens, it never fails, the chairs come cr cr uh, crashing down, causes this big commotion and stops everything. And this has become a metaphor for me. Because I think that some of you came in here today and you're carrying more chairs than you could, or that you should have, or that you should. And so I don't know what those chairs for, are for you, but let's just talk through some of them. Like, like maybe you came in here and you're carrying this chair. It's the Savior Complex chair. This is where someone in your life is in need and you think you're the only one that can care for them and so that you are coming to them and exerting more energy than you should to try and be their Savior. Or maybe it's this chair. This is the comparison chair. This is the one where you're constantly measuring yourself against the success of somebody else. Or, or maybe this is like social media for you that's going to take you out, where you're counting likes and followers and you know, seeing you know, who is coming along and just putting a little heart on your picture or whatever that is, and you're comparing yourself to others, maybe somebody that's always on vacation and you feel like you're never on vacation, and comparison is the weight that you carried in this morning, or maybe it's approval, specifically the need for approval from someone else. Uh, you're, you're performing, not from a place of approval, but for it, constantly trying to get other people to like you, or maybe it's this one. It looks like select soccer, select sports, uh, the, the craziness of life, business, constantly trying to get ahead of the game, or maybe it's this one, where you are moving around and feel like you need to control everything, you're thinking about your kids, constantly moving toward them, wanting to be in control, fighting God for the throne because you need to be in control. Or maybe, maybe today it's this one. Maybe this weekend you did something you're not proud of. Maybe in your marriage you've done something that you've never told anybody. Maybe you've made a choice along the way that you think, hey, I'm going to take that to my grave. And you're carrying this weight, the weight of shame. You think you can't talk about your sin, you gotta come into church like you have it all together and you're pretending like you have it all together. And so there, you're carrying this weight with you everywhere you go and the reason I'm saying this right now because if you continue to carry this weight, it's going to crush you. Or eventually, you're going to <laughs> drop it and there's gonna be a commotion, and the momentum's gonna stop. We're in a series called Momentum. The first week we talked about the momentum of the church, and then we talked about momentum of faith. And then we talked about the momentum in prayer and how momentum in prayer increases your momentum in faith. And today I wanna to talk about what happens when the momentum stops. I'm gonna be in the Word, 1 Peter chapter five this morning. What happens when the momentum stops? The only reason we carry more chairs than we should is because we thought we could. What that is in a word is called pride. We all suffer from this. This is the 
origin of sin, the source of sin. Everyone came in today struggling with pride. It is a real issue. And I will show you from the text how when you continue to carry this struggle of pride, it increases anxiety in your life. And not just does it increase anxiety in your life, but it also makes you a victim to the enemy. Satan loves the prideful. He's coming after you and he's going to attack you as we talk about momentum and when the momentum stops. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit or a prideful spirit before the fall, before the chairs come crashing down. Pride is the root of all sin. As I said, it is the sin that caused the fall. Pride is not trusting God. And you say, well, how do I know today if I'm prideful? Let me ask you some questions. Do you quickly notice pride in others? Counting or pointing out the sins of others? Are you anxious? Are you critical of others? Are you defensive when someone points out sin in your life? Do you constantly seek out others' approval? Are you insecure? Do you feel shame or believe that your sin or brokenness is bigger than God's grace? Do you believe that you are worthless or unforgiven? Does a particular sin define you more than God's claims on your life? I think often we think of the prideful as wanting the spotlight. Sometimes the prideful can't handle the spotlight. They don't want anyone to see them. They want to hide in the shadows. They want to play the background. That too can be pride. Pride is seeking self-importance, if you want a definition. Seeking self-importance. And the solution, humility, is sacrificially serving others. This is what C.S. Lewis said about pride. I love this quote. It comes from mere Christianity. He says, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. This passage, 1 Peter 5, saved my life. This message is near and dear to my heart. About 18 months ago, 19 months ago, uh, um, I was in a place where life had got extremely busy. Not just being a, a father of three and a husband to my wife, but work got crazy, speaking engagements cranked up. I was traveling more than I had ever done. I was working on a, a book uh, for the first time and, and learning all about that new process. A, a family member and close friend of mine was sick and I had kind of jumped in thinking I was the only one that could help them and got in over my head and I'm carrying all of this weight and I, this uh, opportunity comes, to, comes in to speak on the West Coast and so I fly out there. It's gonna be one of the biggest opportunities I've ever had to be in front of the most people and I'm not nervous about it but I'm laying in my hotel room and my heart goes boom, 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 boom. I don't sleep that night. You know, wake up the next day, I caffeinate, you know, drink the coffee, get through the three messages. I fly back to Dallas, and my heart, boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 something's not right. I go to the emergency room, hook me up to the EKG. They say, yeah, you have premature ventricular contractions, PVCs. I'm like, can you fix it? They're like, no, but you can. How? Stop carrying so much. You're carrying more weight than you should. You're telling me that I literally broke my heart? Yeah. So the implications of this reality are real. There's real consequences to going against what God's word says, carrying more than we should. And I'm not saying what happened next for me is for the first time in my life, I'm not a worrier. Okay, I'm, my life's always been marked by peace and trust for the most part, but these waves of anxiety came crashing over my life, even panic attacks. And I was like, what is this going on? It was all tied to what was happening in my heart, which was all tied to what was happening in my world, carrying more weight than I should. I am not, I wanna be careful, I'm not saying that anxiety always happens because of sin. I'm not saying that, don't quote me, you don't need to email me. I'm saying in my case it did. In my case, it did. And I'm showing you in the scripture today that God gives us a, a warning about this. First Peter 5. So Peter wrote this letter in about 64 AD. 
He, the church is under extreme persecution under the Roman Empire. It's scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Peter writes a letter to God's people, the elect, and this is what it says in verse 5. He says, all of you, the reason it starts out all of you is because he's talked to the elders, the leaders in the church, and now he's talked to the young people, and he says... Hey, all of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the enemy of believers throughout the world is under, I'm sorry, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you've been in church long, this little passage here is full of memory verses. Like one after the other after the other. Do you see that? For God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Okay? Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You got that on a coffee cup at home. I know you do, right? Stand firm. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, right? Uh, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that in due time he may lift you up. One memory verse after another, after another, after another. What a rich and dense text. And my first point from it is that pride pauses momentum. Pride pauses momentum. It says God opposes the proud. When you came in here, if you are struggling with pride in your life, you are literally coming up against the most powerful force in the universe. You are positioning yourself as an enemy of God, not wanting to worship God in a humble state, but wanting to be like him. The same sin of Lucifer. I don't want to worship God. I want to be my own God. And you're on the other team. My daughter plays basketball. She wears those pennies, you know those jerseys where they like turn inside out. Like one color on one side, another color on the other side. And so hers is purple and white. And uh, we're going to her game and she has it on the purple side. It's like, Daddy, I hope we're purple today. I'm like, okay, whatever. And uh, and we, we get there, and I see her team on the other side of the court, and I see them, they're all in white. And I'm like, hey, you need to turn your jersey inside out. She's like, why? Why? Daddy, I want to be purple. Like, you need to turn it inside out. No, Daddy, I, I, why? Well, I don't understand. Why do I have to turn it inside out? Because right now you're playing for the other team, okay? You're wearing the other team's colors. This is us with pride. If we come in all proud of ourselves, seeking self-importance, we don't understand that we're playing for the other team. God, loving Father, says explicitly in his word or implicitly in his word that you are the opposition. And so what do we do? He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. What's interesting about this text is it changes slides so fast. Humble, put on humility, anxiety, cares for you, Satan. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, Peter? I, I want to show you how they're all tied together. In the Greek, he's saying, humble yourselves by casting. It's an ongoing, it's not a one-time thing. It's by casting your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Humble yourself by understanding there's someone who can handle the things that you're going through, so you cast it on him. This word cast, is, it's a violent word. It's, it's like a, what you would do if you're scared of bugs and you look and you see you have a cockroach on your shoulder. Ah, like, get off me, cast. Get it off. Cast it on him. Why? Because he's embarrassed of you? No, no, because he's crazy about you. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Why does he go anxiety? Because pride leads to anxiety. That's where, that's where it ends up, or that's, that's the next phase. Um, 
pride leads to anxiety. Anxiety can be caused by pride. If you struggle with anxious thoughts, intrusive thoughts, you struggle with anxiety, yes, do I? It's not helpful. You think, well, that's not helpful. It's like where the scripture says, don't be anxious. Matthew 6, don't worry. Okay, great. Not helpful. <laughs> Here's where I think it can be helpful. One, if it's true, it's going to be helpful. So we got to ask, is it true? If it's true, it can be helpful. And, and here's why I think it's helpful, because if I say, hey, you leave here, you struggle with anxiety, I say, hey, don't be anxious, like just try not to be anxious, fight it. You're going to get tangled up in that spider web. It's going to entangle you, you're going to fight it, you're just going to get trapped in it. But if I leave here and I say, hey, try to be humble, continually renewing your mind around the reality that there's a God and you're not him, but you can trust him, he's good and he loves you and continue to renew your mind around that, that you can be hu become humble easier than you can become unanxious. And so let's test it just to kind of see if there's some truth here. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Can someone who is completely protected by a sovereign deity and completely provided for by a sovereign deity, if they know that they are, can they be anxious? If they know, and you might say, well, yeah, because there's this, the chemical, brain chemistry, so forth and so on. I don't, that's all legit and real and true. But what that does is uh, brings us to a place where it allows us to doubt that God is in control and that he's providing for us. And so we're continual, continuing to learn that God is in control and that he's providing for us. And so what is the reason that we would carry more than we should? It's because of pride, and pride pauses momentum. But that's not the only thing that ceases our, or stops our momentum, also sin does. That's my second point, sin stops momentum. Sin also stops momentum from the text. Be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. That there is an enemy. This is real. Men, you have to listen to this. Women, you have to listen to this. There's an enemy. He hates you. He hates your children. He hates your family. He hates your marriage. He hates your singleness. He hates your celibacy. He hates you. And he wants to take you out. And what, why does he go from anxiety to Satan? Because I think Peter is telling us, the Holy Spirit through Peter is telling us, that Satan, the pen that he plays in, is where you're worried, you're, you're anxious. That your anxiety is the cage that the enemy attacks you in. He, he's smart, art of war. It's, oh, you worried about your kids? Let me come after you there. Oh, you worried about your job? Okay, I see. I got my spot, my point of entry. Oh, you worried about your health? Okay. That's where I'm going to get you. What else you worried about? Give me more. Give me more. It's the pen that he plays in. He's a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Think of him like a stray cat. He's coming around. He's looking for food. He's hungry. He's a hungry stray cat. What happens when you feed a stray cat? you got a pet. That's what happens. The stray cat found a home. Okay. What happens when you starve a stray cat? He goes to the neighbor's house. Because he's hungry. He's looking for food, and so he's going to go wherever he's fed. You know what else happens when you feed something? It grows. It gets bigger. That cat, that lion that's seeking to devour you got stronger in your life. Why? Because you fed it. This is the lie of one last time. You do something one last time. He just got stronger. The grip on your life just got bigger. So you starve him. You let him go hungry. Make him leave. Stand firm. Resist him, it says. Stand firm in the faith. And God comes to your rescue. You know how Satan, the art of war, you know how Satan works? He works like Netflix. Satan and Netflix, they're the same, same thing. <laughs> you, you know how Netflix works? Anybody have Netflix? Y'all have Netflix? It's okay. It's, I, I have it. It's okay. It's a wonderful thing. Netflix. 
It's so smart, Netflix. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, I see you like Seinfeld. What about Friends? What about this? What about this? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, you like Stranger Things. You might like Bird Box or Stranger Things 2. This is how the enemy works. It's what he puts in front of you. Feeds you more of what you've eaten. You know? Oh, you're desperate for relationships, huh? Oh, you want to be married desperately, huh? Why don't you watch this romantic comedy and this romantic comedy and this romantic comedy and this romantic... Watch another Jennifer Aniston special thing or something, right? This is what he does. Oh, you like violence. Watch violence. Watch violence. Watch violence. Oh. Oh, you, you like to look at people naked. Really? Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And everywhere you look, it is. It's a huge part of my story. I was enslaved to, porno to a pornography addiction for over a decade. Enslaved to it, enslaved to it. Thought I'd never be well. Before I was a Christian, I didn't even know it was wrong. And then I became a Christian and experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But it's not like I trusted in Christ and it went away. It stayed right there and owned me. And I thought, you know what I thought? I thought, you know, it, it just seemed like everywhere I looked, it was. There was temptation everywhere I looked. And I thought, this is going to be a struggle for the rest of my life. And now after 15 years of complete sobriety by the grace of God, I, I know that that's not true. That what I was doing, I was feeding the enemy and he was devouring me. But now that I've stood firm for 15 years, to, to find it, I'd have to seek it out. I'd have to search for it. I'd have to look for it. And God's restored me. He's allowed me to find healing. And it's the same healing that's available to you. As you resist the devil, stand firm in the faith. Because the temptation is, the temptation in all sin is to think that you're the only one, that you're terminally unique, that nobody can understand or connect with what you're going through. You have this unique struggle, right? And it says the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. He's telling us something really important here. Other people are struggling just like you are, right? You say, what, did he just say pornography up there, pastor, what? Why would you do that? So that you can be free. That's why. That's why. Because I know you're struggling just like I was. Just like I do. And maybe yours is different. Like maybe you're like repulsed right now. Let me help you. Your struggle is self-righteousness. And you can't even see it. And it's taking you out. Your struggle is legalism. Your, struggling is, your struggle is thinking your sins are better than others. And it's gross. It's gross like porn. It's gross. Shame is not always, or, or pride is not always in the spotlight. Right? Why do I say that? Because, man, I, you know, I get off the stage and I stand right here. And the lines get long. And then people come up, I've done it, I don't know, hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times. People come up. Hey, man, I got to talk to you. What? Talk to me. I'm right here. What? What's up? Man, I got to tell you something. I don't, it's hard. I don't know how I'm going to say it. I don't know how. I'm, I'm struggling. I, my story is just like yours. I'm pornography. Yes. Yeah. But I can't tell anybody. Nobody, nobody's going to understand. Like, what about the last five people I just talked to with the same struggle? You think they might understand? It goes, it goes from that, like, it, it could put any struggle there, right? Like, it's like, I got to talk to you. What? What's up? Talk to me. What? Man, I struggle with same-sex attraction. But nobody, nobody's going to understand. What? Hey, come here. Come here. Come here. Hey, listen. I love you. God loves you. He's crazy about you. He's not embarrassed of you. I'm so glad you're here. And you know what? We're in this together. I'm not going anywhere. The church is going to come around you. We're going to help. I'm so glad you're here. Okay, let, let me pray. Let us pray. Right? They leave. Next person comes up. Hey, man. Hey, I got to tell you something. I can't.
would tell you about you. What? What's up? What? I struggle with same-sex attraction. I'm the only one. No, you're not. See that person that just left? They do, you know? No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. But, but my, my point is, everybody's struggling just like you are. And you know what the enemy does? He's so crafty. No, you're the only one. You're the only controlling mama in the whole world. No one in the history of creation has been stuck in sin growing toward Christ. Uh, what I mean by stuck in sin, no one's been actively feeding some, the, the, the roaring lion and becoming more godly. And, and this is why God hates sin, because he loves you. Because he loves you. So he dealt with your sin in his sovereignty, in his kindness, in his grace toward you. He dealt with your sin because he loves you. This is why shepherds, God's people, pastors, if you will, the church leaders, this is why we help people struggling with sin. Because we love people. Because let's define sin. Let's define sin. Sin is you missing out on God's best. Like God wants something better for you. You getting something that's second best or less. And uh, so people who love you and love God say, no, there's something better out there. It may mean a fight. It may mean a struggle because everybody in the world is struggling just like you are. But as you struggle, you're going to experience something better than what you have. And so how do we start there? What does that look like? Humility. It looks like humility. Humility invites help when you're stuck. That's my third point from this text. Humility invites help when you're stuck. Humility invites help when you're stuck. It says that God gives grace to the humble, or, or my version says God shows favor to the humble. You might say gives grace to the humble. He's favorable to the humble. He's moving toward those that realize their need for him, and God, the most powerful force in the world, is helping them. How beautiful is that? He's helping them. God comes to your aid when you humble yourself. When you're in a place where you're like, I can't, but you can. I know that I can't, right? When you grow your relationship with God, like people say all the time, like, well, how did you get free? How did you experience freedom from your struggles? I grew my affection for Christ. I, I found a greater desire in Jesus. I was discipled. I began to learn the Bible. I began to fall deeper in love with Jesus. And my sin got to a place where it wasn't worth it because any time I would sin, I, I would return like a dog to his vomit to that struggle. I didn't feel the intimacy with Jesus. And what happened is the intimacy with Jesus was so great that I didn't want to compromise it. I can remember very vividly, very specifically, driving down the highway. There was a big billboard. I knew it well. On the side of the road, on that, that billboard was a, a woman without hardly any clothes on. And, and I had looked at that billboard, but on this particular day, I was being discipled, I, I was, dis I was, uh, I was uh, being taught the scriptures, I was praying on the regular, and as that billboard came close, and I felt it in my flesh, I knew it was there, I knew it was coming at me, I thought, you know what, today, it's not worth it, because this is better. This relationship with Jesus is better. It's coming, it's coming. No, 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 you can starve. I'm not feeding you. I'm not feeding you. Uh -uh. Nothing is going to compromise this. You can starve. Go somewhere else. Not here. I got nothing for you. You say, how can he say this stuff? Because I'm free, man. I've been set. Christ set me free. My sin doesn't own me. I'm not identified by my sin. I've been freed from my sin. I'm identified by the freedom from my sin. You see, it could be you too. It's available to you. God wants from you humility for you to walk in dependence, that he's a father that wants to help you. What does this look like? Let me show you. Uh, I've got a son. His name is Weston. And he was four years old. I'm, I'm in the living room. I'm sitting on the couch. He's sitting on the hearth of the fireplace. He's, he's sitting there like this, you know. And I just see him, and he's just kind of like staring and rocking and doing this. And I'm, I'm watching him because I don't know what's going on. And his eyes kind of start filling up with tears. And he goes, Daddy, we got to talk. Like, wow, that's serious for a four-year-old. Like, I'm thinking it's not going to be like monster trucks and baseball. Like, what are, we, what are we talking about? I'm like, buddy, let's talk. I'm right here. Let's talk. Turn off the TV. What's up, bud? I get on the fireplace with him, curl up beside him. Daddy, I don't know why I do what I do. Well, what did you do? 
What are you doing? What? What happened? He said, the, the, the good things that I want to do, I don't do, but the bad things I'm not supposed to do, this is what I keep on doing. Now, if you've been in the Bible long, okay. I mean, he is, he is quoting Romans. Uh, I'm like, did you memorize it? Like, what's going on here? And I just say, hey, buddy, that's, listen, that's why you got a daddy. That's why I'm here. Like, I'm, I'm in this with you. Tell me when you're struggling, like, what you want to do. Tell me what you don't know, what you should do, and I'll help you. And, and to the best of my ability, I'm always going to point you to what I think is going to lead to life. Because I love you. And he said, you will? I said, yeah, I will. He said, Daddy. I said, why? Because I'm really glad we had this talk. I said, man, me too. Me too. I said, you're a good son. He said, hey, you're a good daddy. And that's what I did. I was like, oh, I'm done. I'm undone, you know. And, and is that not the heart of God towards you? Is that not all he wants from you? He doesn't need you to act like you have it all together. He needs you to come to him and say, I don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. See, Jesus is a savior. You know what a savior does? You know what he does? He saves people. You know who he saves? People who need saving. Who does the lifeguard save? The person who's swimming really well, has it all together? Michael Phelps out there, is that who he saves? No, he saves the person flailing in the water, screaming for help. I can't swim. And he's moving toward him. Jesus, he's the best savior in the world. Like he's the best at it. When he is going to do his job description, it's not when you have your act all together. It's when you come and you're like, man, Jesus, do I ever need help? I am a mess. He's like, I got you. I got you. Take a deep breath right now and exhale and, and let like the pride and the self-righteousness and the appearance of good, well, you're not good. If you were, I'd be out of a job. Right? Because I teach a book that helps you and shows you that you're not perfect, but, but it shows you who is. God, he loves a humble heart because he has a humble heart. You can write that down. God loves a humble heart because he has a humble heart. And I know, I can just tell from your response that some of you struggle with anxiety. And I would just tell you, that anxiety is a gift. When it pushes you to prayer, when it pushes you closer to God, it is a gift. When it distracts you from God, when it owns you and moves you away from Him, when it gets the best of you, it's a curse. But when you, when you go, okay, oh, I feel it coming on, I need to move deeper into prayer, that's a gift. So we're to put on humility, that's what it says. It says this is the uniform of God's people. This is what we wear charging down the battlefield, humility. This is the dress code of heaven, humility. This is what you put on, humility. Put on humility, okay? This is the application, put on humility. What does that look like? How do I put on humility, okay? Let's just think about this for a second. You guys know, do you ever like look at your day to figure out what you're going to wear? Anybody else do that? Or, or maybe you look at like the weather app, weather.com, especially in Texas, especially right now, because our weather's like, whoosh, whoosh, you know? Is it gonna be 32 degrees or 107? Like, what's it gonna be? And so you think, do I need a coat? Do I need to wear layers, short sleeves, long sleeves, pants, shorts? What do I wear? Flip flops? Is it there? We're not there yet. But um, if you wore them, that's fine. So uh, you know, what do I what do I need to wear? What do I need to wear? Right? And and for some of us, like I'll look at my meetings. And I'm like, oh, okay, for that meeting, I probably need to, to dress up. It's probably not workout clothes day. You know? Right? Where where am I going? So I have a friend, the wisest man I know, well, most God fearing man I know. He, every morning, he goes in his closet, he looks at his day, and as he's thinking about what he's going to wear, he thinks about what meetings he's really going to need to wear humility in. He's like, oh, for that one, I'm going to need a lot of humility. Oh, that guy, he's not very nice to me. I don't think he likes me. I'm really going to need to wear humility. Oh, that angry atheist dude, okay, I'm going to need to put on a lot of humility for that one. And he just thinks about it, and he begins to pray for his day. Lord, when I go into that 12 o'clock, when I go into that lunch, would you help me be humble. Would you help me, Philippians 2, wear the humility of Jesus? 
and he puts it on. He asks the Holy Spirit to put it on. And you can do that same exercise. That's just something I've stolen from him. I, I've started to do that myself. And sometimes I forget to, and I, and I know when I forget to. And so this text, it calls us to cast something off, which is our anxiety, the things that are weighing us down. Take off what's weighing you down and put on humility. Because pride pauses momentum, sin stops momentum, and humility helps when you're stuck. And so he's saying, hey, I don't want you to carry things you weren't meant to carry. You remember what Jesus says? He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You remember what, he, what, what the author of Hebrews says? It's chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, take off the sin that so easily entangles you. Right? Take off that which you're trapped in, which so easily entangles you, and throw it off. It says, the thing that hinders you. And run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. As I think about my own life, like this is, this is the thing that has healed me. This is where I've experienced healing is by every morning fixing my mind on the things of Jesus, understanding what he's done for me, that he doesn't want me to carry things. And it's interesting because, you know, when those chairs come crashing down, you know, what will happen is somebody will come to their aid. I've seen it over and over. They'll come to their aid with one of those carts. You've seen those chair carts where you can like put chairs on it and they'll say, hey, you know, clearly you can't carry all that. Why don't you put it on here? Why don't you put it on here? This is what Christ is telling you to do. He's saying, hey, you don't need, right? You don't need to have a savior. You don't need to have a savior complex. Why? Because you have a savior. And because you have a savior, you don't have to have a savior complex. He's the savior, right? And so he says, hey, listen. If you're going to compare yourself to anyone, compare yourself to me so that you can realize your need for me because he's perfect and you're not perfect. That's why he had to die, because you're not perfect, right? And you say, hey, listen, you think that you're in control, you got the whole world in your hands, that's not how the song goes. He's got the whole world in his hands. You were never meant to carry the whole world. And so because he's in control, you don't have to. He has your children. He has your relationship. And so what that means is you can stop wearing yourself out, okay, with stuff that won't matter in eternity. Stop fretting things that won't matter even a year from now, much less a hundred years from now, right? You know what he said? He said to rest. He said to rest. And you're still fighting for his approval, even though he's told you you have it. You got an A plus. It was his A plus. So don't perform for approval, but from it, because he's already given it to you. He's given you approval, right? He said, that's, that's what I did on the cross, is you get my righteousness. And so you're going to walk in here, and you think that you're going to keep sitting on your shame. And you're not going to let anybody in. And you don't think that's going to crush you? You think you're going to be the first person to take your sin to the grave and be okay? No, there's freedom in talking about it, confessing it, confessing it to God in your prayer closet. It's not what James 5, 16 says. Confess your sins to one another so that you'd experience healing. And so don't sit on your shame. Don't carry your shame. But put it where it belongs. The one who died for your shame. There's all your stuff. If you feel like your life is a mess, that was a mess. The bloody man on the cross, that was a mess. He did that for you. He said, Cast your cares. Him because he's crazy about you. 
He loves you. He cares for you. I'm going to pray that you would know that. Lord, as we go to sing, would you stir in our hearts the reality that you love us, that our sins don't mark us, our struggles don't mark us, where we've fallen don't mark us. But where we run the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on not just the one that started our faith, but the one who finishes it, the perfecter of it. Pray that this is a place where everyone feels welcome. And that they know that you love them, not, not what they will be, but like right now. Not when they get their act together, but right now you love them. You're crazy about it. As we sing this, we just, will you fix our hearts? Will you fix that reality in our hearts, God? We need your help. You're a really good helper. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your favor. It is in Jesus' name. Amen.